Moses and his faith. You and your faith. That's my assigned text from Hebrews chapter 11. His full story is obviously in the book of Exodus. And my wife r r wrote out for me yesterday uh, something that uh, appears in a brand new Bible she bought for me. It's called the Moses Mystique. Can I read it for you? Moses murdered a man. It's not a good way to start. Argued with God. Lost his temper more than once. Was prohibited from entering the promised land because he disobeyed God in the wilderness. But Moses died, but Moses died full of grace and favor with God because he got up more times than he fell down. When you consider the heroes revered in Judaism, Islam, or Christianity, no other individual other than Jesus shines more brightly than Moses. That's a powerful one. The New Testament mentions Moses, the deliverer of the Hebrews from Egypt, more times than any other Old Testament figure. And he is the most prominent prophetic figure in Muslim Quran. I didn't know that one. When it is about Moses, that, what is it there about, a Mos, about Moses that makes him a hero to so many? It's the contrast of failure and faith. This is interesting. It's probably at the heart of the Moses mystique. We identify him with, with him. Guilty of manslaughter, fears and doubts when God called him to be the deliverer of his fellow countrymen, but we revere his faith. He was brave, he was faithful, he was outspoken, compassionate, and loyal. He kept his eye on the eternal promise. Moses was all we know we are. Catch this. And all we know we want to be. He was a failure. But he was also fa uh, faithful. If you, anyone here today has failed ever, do not give up. God used Moses and surely he wants to use you. End of the mosaic mystique. Thank you for writing that for me, Joyce. That was extra biblical. It didn't come out of the Bible text. It came out of the notes in my Jeremiah Bible. And I'm not talking about the prophet, but David Jeremiah, the present day preacher you see on TV all the time. Okay, that's Moses and his faith. I'm going to get back to that in a more extensive way, but let me just say this by way of introduction. I read a guy by the name of Tim Keller, and he uh, something he said about faith caught my attention, and I wrote it in my journal, and it, it now appears in this these sermon notes I have before me. He said this about our faith. He says, "Faith is listening to God." Hmm. Are you? Are you listening to God? That's an important element of any faith, that you listen to God. Here's the second thing he says. It's showing courage in time of testing and opposition. I have an idea that somebody here is struggling with something today. I don't know what it is. But I'm not asking you to ignore those issues of life. But you face them square on. 
in faith. Faith is showing courage. That's the word. It's listening and showing courage. He says there's one more thing about faith. I'm talking about you and your faith right now. It's showing humility when everything's going well. Now I'm looking at a crowd of people that look uh, as comfortable as anybody I've ever seen in my life. By the way, this, this is hay fever time and that's why I'm doing this. Starts August the 15th. I'm not preaching till hay fever time is over. Okay, okay, listen. Showing humility when everything is going well. The danger here is that when everything's going right, and I think that's happening to a lot of you people here, there's a danger of pride. Thinking pride gets in the way. You're thinking, look where I got. Look where I am. And you start feeling comfortable and you then you stop listening. Be careful. Now let's go to our text, Hebrews chapter 11. There are five things that I want to bring to your attention here. The first is found in verse 23. Let me just identify it first. You notice the first two words of verse number 23. If your Bible reads like mine, it, is sa it says, by faith. You see those words? Go to the next verse, 24. Same thing, same two words, by faith. That's number two. Then look at verse 27. Go down to verse 27. Here's the third thing that has my attention here today. The words, the verse starts with two words, by faith. What's that? Verse 27? Now look at 28. Here's number four. The fourth thing. By faith. You see it again. And one more. Verse 29. There's my text. There's the context of where I'm going with you here today. This these verses guide my thoughts about Moses' faith. By the way, before I get back to verse 23, if you want a New Testament review of Moses' life, go to Acts chapter 7. I'm not going to go there today. That's not, but it's Stephen's sermon, and he just reviews the whole life of Moses. And for some reason, I've been overlooking that for a while. Okay. Verse number 23, the first act of faith for Moses and his life. And that is that he was born by parents of faith. In other words, there's the faith of Moses' parents. I want you to note that. Think about it for a few minutes. The fact that Moses was born is an act of faith itself. I don't know how to explain that, but every birth to me is something special. The scripture says he was beautiful. Another verse says he was special. He was. God had a plan for his life, just like he has for your life. Am I overstating that? I don't think so. He, Moses, was preserved by another act of faith. It was risky to be born to a Hebrew family in that era, I'll tell you. Just ask the midwives who were taken, charged with the responsibility, but they helped preserve this young man. He began life being a child of faith. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, our heritage is important. Moses was fortunate to have believing parents. To hide their baby with the help of those Egyptian midwives 
from the authorities was surely an act of faith. The full story is in Exodus chapter 2, about 10 verses. Godly parents cannot pass on their faith. I've said that from this pulpit before. But they certainly, catch this now, can provide an atmosphere of faith at home. Parents are to be an example. They're to set the pattern. A home should be the first school of faith for any child. Catch that, salvationists. Never underestimate the power and effectiveness of a mother's prayer. I don't think I'd be standing where I am today in this pulpit if it were not for the faith of my mother, my father. I told you a couple weeks ago that we had, uh, we had devotions at our table and we had to be there. And I forgot to say to you, we had to sing for our dessert. Would you like to hear one of the choruses <laughs> that I had to sing for my dessert when I was a kid? Now you listen to me and you know why Doug Holman won't let me sing in the songsters. Faith turns the night into the day. Love drives all doubts and fears away. Now my heart is singing and the joy bells ringing. Listen to the music of the chimes. Faith is sufficient all the time. That's faith. Hallelujah, one a Savior. That's enough to make me sing, shine, shout, something like that. <laughs> I'm still going to come to songs for practice, whether you let me sing or not. Thank God for godly parents. Okay, next verse. 24, 25, and 26. Three verses. Second act of faith here. Moses was loyal. Catch this. Moses was loyal to his real people. You read the text already, so I'm not going to read it a second time. Moses was loyal to his real people, the children of Abraham. And that, in my estimation, took faith. Who are my real people? Who are your real people? Oh, I know it's your biological family. The real people who are important to me are right here in this room. People I'm with now. People with whom I'm with most every Lord's Day. People I pray for, people I hold dear, people who I include as true believers even beyond the walls of this church. I actually took a vow of loyalty. Loyalty is my operative word here. Let me say something I never said publicly in all my life. A vow is voluntary. A person never has to make one. If you listen to what Jesus said. But once a vow is uttered or made or spoken, the Lord considers that sacred and bound, binding. I hold that dear. My daughter is not here today. Jill and her husband. And for good reason. 
They have a, a sign above their mantle. Some of you have been there and seen this and read it a good many times. It has to do with character. Here's how it reads, if I remember correctly. Character is being loyal to your faith, loyal to your friends and family, and loyal to your work. I like that. That's burned deeply in my heart. And I've made a vow that I want to be loyal to you, to all God's children, and to my faith family. Do the same. The second act of faith then was his loyalty to his real people, the children of Abraham. Turn to verse 27. There came a day when Moses, because of his intervention on the behalf of his people, had to withdraw from Egypt and go to Midian. You know where Midian is? Well, you got Egypt, and then you have, what is it, uh, uh, this body of sea or water. Then you have the Sinai Peninsula, and way, there's another body of water, and then way beyond that, beyond that is Midian. That's where he went. Guess how long? 40 years. He left the comforts of Egypt, and where did he go? He went to a desert land and became a shepherd. And you know what he learned? He learned some vital things about the spiritual life. How to listen to God. Remember that encounter he had at the burning bush? The real God? God appeared to him and he heard audibly God's voice. I never heard audibly God's voice ever. I've met some people who say they have, and I don't discount that. But he learned disciplines of the spiritual life 40 years in the desert as a shepherd. That's quite a contrast, leaving the palace and all the comforts that you enjoy in your palace. And he went to the desert and became a slave. Well, it was kind of that. He became a servant of his of his father-in-law and a shepherd of sheep. That's quite, a, that's quite a change in life. But it was preparation, preparation for what God really had in mind for his life. By the way, three 40-year periods in the life of Moses, the first 40 in a palace, all the comforts and blessings of that, 40 years in Midian, and then 40 years back, back in the desert, in, in the wilderness. He never did get, however, to the promised land, as did most of the as other Israelites with him didn't because of their disobedience. Okay, where am I here in my notes? If you want to read the full, uh, full uh, passage on that, it's, again, Exodus chapter 2, verse 14 through 22. It took courage for Moses to leave the ease and the pleasure of palace life and go to Midian. And for some of you, I'll say this. It took faith and courage to become part of this family. Leave what you have and be here. I admire that. Loyalty to your real people. Okay, here's the fourth thing about Moses' faith. Verse 28, it identifies here the fourth act of faith in the passage. It's Moses making all the arrangements for the first Passover. Now, this is no little thing. Israel's amazing rescue after 400 years of slavery. Moses is doing something here special. I'm talking about the end of the old life of slavery for the children of Israel. 
I don't think they were called children of Israel at that time, but children of Abraham. Verse 28. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood. You see it there? So that the destroying of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. So we have the unleavened bread that had to be made. The Passover lamb that had to be slain. The doorposts had to be smeared with the blood of a lamb. So that the death angel would pass over. Now here's the amazing thing. Put anyone to sleep yet? When Moses gave those unusual instructions, he never doubted. This is how it's going to be, and this is what we're going to do. He did it in faith. And as he did, he laid down that which was to be observed annually for all time by God's children of Abraham. True Israelites. I don't believe that applies so much to Gentiles, but he never doubted, and he did it in faith. We old-timers, here we go again. We old-timers used to sing it this way. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to put it to melody right now. Bear with me. Christ, our Redeemer, died on the cross. This is old-time stuff. You're not going to find it in that new songbook. Christ, our Redeemer, died on the cross, died for the sinner, paid all his due. Sprinkle your soul with the blood of the Lamb, and I will pass over, will pass over you. And the chorus goes, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass over over you praise his name glory okay fifth act of faith fifth the fifth first we have moses parents then we have an act of faith in lo moses loyalty third his defense of a helpless hebrew nation and their exit his exit to midian and fourth act of faith, the preparation and arrangements for the first Passover. Here's the fifth. Verse number what is it, Mama? 29, I think. Exodus 14, anyway, is where it appears. I preached on this about a year and a half ago, right from this pulpit. I was introduced to this uh, guy in uh, Nashville named Rob Morgan. Joyce and I read him every morning on the Passover principles. Oh, that's a great book. He teaches 10 principles of spiritual life from Exodus 14, and I use those in a teaching session. The miracle crossing the Red Sea is stunning. It's inspirational and it's life-changing. How to be delivered from a tight and difficult and dangerous crisis situation. Let me tell you, I've been there repeatedly and God knows how to deliver his people. He delivered me out of all my troubles. And you're looking at a free man today. Hallelujah. Glory. Here we have a faith leader, a people who were prepared to do the impossible at the command of God. They realized that the greatest barrier in the world was no barrier at all if God be there and help us to overpass it. Aaron, where's your husband today? He is from Sri Lanka. I met him before I ever met you, Aaron, I think. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. But I, I, I did. He, he ever teach you this chorus? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? It appears three times in Scripture. 
Genesis 18, Jeremiah, someplace in there, and Luke chapter number 1. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. No, nothing is too hard for the Lord. If he were here, I'd have him sing it for you. I better not. I believe he's at work, right? What? Sleeping? Huh? Uh, let it go. I can't hear. <laughs> okay, where am I here? I want to talk about you and your faith. And it's six minutes to 12. I've been preaching that long. I got four words that I want to use as I speak to you about you and your faith. Four words. Number one. It begins with a revelation from God. Faith begins with a revelation from God. Most of us in here believe in, in the, that God is self-revealing. He, he wants to show us who he is. The main business of the Holy Spirit is to be a teacher. He shows us. He stirs in our hearts before we ever stir. You know I love this verse from Philippians 2.13. It is he that worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. It all starts with God. Faith does not happen unless he moves in your heart. Faith begins. I know you have to respond. But your response is a response to what he's done in your life. What he's doing in your life. And what he's done for you. God doesn't hide himself. He reveals himself to his people. Faith begins with a revelation. He keeps doing it too. More and more and more. He wants you to learn. He wants your relationship. Oh, that leads me to the second word I want to use. Faith begins with the revelation. Faith grows. Catch this now. That the operative word is grows. Faith grows out of a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's got to grow. It's got to develop. It's got to mature. You don't want to be a baby all your life. You want to grow. If we walk in the light, light means capital L, Jesus, the light of the world. If we walk in the light, it's the book too. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and that includes him. Fellowship and the, listen to this, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from how much sin? All sin. How do you like that? Faith begins with a revelation. Faith grows out of a relationship with his son. Are you walking arm in arm with Jesus? Trusting, trusting, trusting him to lead the way? It's a faith thing. It's a faith thing. How many words did I say I had? Here's the third. Here's the third. The operative word is motivate. Faith motivates us to do, catch that word, do the will of God. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, talking about faith, talking about faith ain't going to pull it off. 
You gotta do it! Are you with me? You, look, you read all of the book of Hebrews and what are you going to find? It filled, it's filled with verbs. What's a verb, Mrs. Anderson? What? Action, uh, action word. Okay, are you active? Doing the will of God? Have you put it into practice? Are you really walking with him? Are you doing what God planned and called you to do? It's easier to, to preach ten sermons than it is to live one. You got the hard part. Of course, I'm talking to myself at the same time. It's doing the will. Have you ever sung this chorus? I'm not going to sing it anymore. I'm not. <laughs> doing the will of God. Doing the will of God. Now catch this line. The best, the best thing I know in this world below is doing the will of God. Now, this ain't a church unless we do the will of God. And that was the operative word of William Booth. You ain't going to sit there and talk about faith all day. We're going to do something about it. And that's our movement. Faith motivates us. There's something about it that causes us to want to do what God has in plan in mind for us to do. Praise his name. Okay. That's three words. I got one more. I said I was going to talk about you and your faith. One more word. And then I'm I think I'm through. Check my notes here in a minute. Uh, the the fourth word is the operative word is results. And here's how it goes. Faith results. Get this one now. Try this one on. Faith results in clear evidence that God is supernaturally at work in your life. Through answered prayer. Through an abundant harvest of spiritual life, love, joy. Matthew chapter number four. I mean, Galatians chapter 5, verse 20, the fruit of the Spirit, a ninefold thing. You ought to, your life ought to make, that ought to make you beautiful, I'll tell you. Inwardly adorned. Where was I? Faith results in clear evidence. Not only not only the fruit of the Spirit, not only in answered prayer, but also in the use, catch this now, of your gifting. What God has made you good at. You practice it. I was worried about these, this sermon stuff I'm, I'm called to do. It says... Somebody said to me, and I've been saying it all my life, use it or lose it. You know, if you preach, you better stop, you better preach, or you ain't gonna, you haven't got anything to say. You're gonna, you're gonna lose the edge. God has made you good for something, good at something. Every true believer. If you don't believe me, Look at Romans chapter 12, verses 6, 7, and 8. Has six or seven gifts. Gifts. And it says there, according to the proportion of your faith. So, faith results in clear evidence in our life that God is supernaturally at work there. By the power of the Spirit that works in your life. Amen.
and amen. I think I'm, no, I'm not through. It is uh, five minutes after 12, though. Can you bear with me a minute? Um, you know what Galatians 5, 6 says? Ask a question. What really counts? What really counts in life? And then it, uh, it uh, gives an answer. Listen carefully. The only thing that counts, according to Matthew, uh, Galatians 5, 6, the last part of that verse, is your faith that expresses itself in love. I have in my notes here the Message Bible use of that verse, and it scared the life out of me when I first read it. Catch this one. This is a new version. I, I, in fact, I don't even know if, I don't know if it meet all the scholars' renditions, but here it goes. Message Bible, Galatians 5, verse 6. It says this, For in Christ, these are the words, neither our most conscientious religion, and boy, I got a lot of that, nor disregard of religious religion amounts to anything. Uh, uh, that ain't the way it reads in uh, authorized. I guess you call it authorized. Okay, can I run that by you once again? For in Christ, neither our most conscientious religion nor disregard of religion amounts to anything. What really matters, it goes on, is something more, far more interior. Faith expressed in love. We're talking about faith in Jesus. Okay. Okay. I want to know how your faith is today. Are you, are you comfortable, satisfied, smug, easy, ready to go and forget what this has been about? Or do you like to do something about it?